You're listening to Word Slinger Podcast episode 127, doing fiction a little bit different with George Mahaffey. This episode of the Word Slinger Podcast is brought to you by Draft to Digital. Convert your manuscript, distribute it online, and get support the whole way at drafttodigital.com. It's the Word Slinger Podcast, where story matters. Build your brand, write your book, redefine who you are. It's all about the story here. What's yours? Now, here's the guy who invented pants optional, Kevin Tomlinson, the word slinger. Word slinger. Hey, everybody. This is Kevin Tomlinson, the word slinger. I'm a uh, a slightly tired word slinger this morning. (laughs) Those of you who may not know... um, we in the Houston area, and I am in the Houston area. I'm in Pearland, Texas, um, which is just outside of Houston, by the way. But we have recently gone through uh, quite a bit of destruction here. We've had we had uh, Hurricane Harvey, who um, has man, he's the comeback kid. I mean, he's uh, he he tore through Mexico. He came up through the Gulf of Mexico. He uh, tore up Corpus Christi, which is. Uh, south of us, uh, south southwest of uh, Houston, uh, along the coast, and then he ripped his way right up the coast, and then hung out on top of us for several days, uh, dumping water everywhere. This is the greatest, is, uh, from what I've read, this is the uh, the greatest flooding disaster in the United States in our history. Um, so pretty. Pretty bad, pretty bad shape here, man. Uh, it's it's been uh, it's been an ordeal. Now, Karen and I, in all this, we were incredibly blessed. Um, now, the every everywhere around us. I mean, I, I could I could drive five hundred feet in every direction from where we live and uh, and encounter floodwaters. Uh, and things got a little on the frightening side for us um, for a while there. But we actually did not get major flooding. In our we our flo- our home was not flooded. Um, the uh, the uh, the apartment complex that we live in uh, we live in the Pearland Town Center uh, that did not flood uh, it, it did flood but it didn't flood to a point where we were in any immediate danger from flood water we actually had actually more danger <laughs> because we couldn't get out for quite a while uh, and no grocery stores were open no you know we were starting to run low low on food um, so that was a little frightening, but there are so many souls out there who've had so much worse happen. They've lost homes. Uh, some people lost lives. Uh, this is, it's been a horrible tragedy. Um, but I can say this, and this, this is more, I hear people say this and and say, this is like a Texas spirit kind of thing. Um, I think this is a human spirit kind of thing. I think Texans in particular, um, we do rise up when these occasions come, our way, uh, but I, I saw such an outpouring of humanity and and just just incredible strength and courage. Um, we had you know people organized. They got organized via Facebook. Uh, they came out here in bass boats and uh, jet skis and you know monster trucks. And I <laughs> I've just never seen people come together uh, the way we have. We forgot about politics. We forgot about. Uh, the world stage uh we forgot about the uh the awfulness of uh only moments before you know uh all the political you know back and forth and each raking each other we forgot all of that and we just helped each other um sorry i'm sorry i'm very sorry <laughs> it was it's it's been an amazing uh couple of weeks um some of our family uh, lost lost their homes. Uh, in particular, the sister of my sister-in-law. So, just sort of barely related there, I guess. But uh, she lost her home in this. So we're we're finding ways to help. Uh, right this minute, I'm uh, Kara and I are playing host to uh, some good friends of mine who uh, come from Sweeney, Texas, and then that entire town apparently is. It's just underwater. Um, their home apparently was safe. They they believe it's safe. So, uh, you know, that's good. Thank God. And uh, But they couldn't stay. It was a mandatory evacuation. So we're, we're hosting them for a few days. 
Uh, it's a little cozy, but it's it's kind of fun to have. Uh, my, this is my this is one of my oldest friends <laughs> hanging out with, uh, and there his three kids and uh, his wife. So, uh, in a two bedroom apartment, we've got I think we got pl- space to spare. Really, I, I think we've done all right. And the rest restaurants and uh, gro- uh, grocery stores have opened up again in our immediate area, uh, although they're not getting supplied uh, as easily, but. Uh, we're kind of getting around it. I know there's a gas. Not, there's not a gas shortage, by the way. Um, looking into this, I've discovered that the it's not a gas shortage, but there is a run on gas stations, uh, and plus a lot of people have fueled up and uh, you know fill, filled up uh, gas cans and things heading for Houston to help out. So it's not really a shortage so much as there's a you know, people are getting a little worried. Um, but be calm, you know. I mean, it's things haven't returned directly back to normal but they will uh just just have faith in you know if you if you believe in god which i do uh, have faith god's got us but you can also have faith in the uh humanity around us because i've seen it man i mean it, it's there's a there are a lot of people, <laughs> just truly beautiful courageous people out there the people who uh the the uh, emergency response folks uh have been incredible um law enforcement fire departments medical personnel everybody's just been incredible even the media has been just amazing uh there's been some sensationalism of course but a little bit of uh disaster porn but uh you know everybody's i actually watched a reporter uh dive in to help out (laughs) so just incredible um anyway this is not the uh Hurricane Harvey podcast uh but i do i do appreciate you letting me have a few moments to talk about that um now, all that said, I've got a great guest today. Uh, he actually co-authored a book with my good friend Justin Sloan, who I uh, now you if you have listened for a while, you know that Justin and I we also do a podcast together. Together, uh, sorry for the stumble there. The uh, Creative Writing Career Podcast. You can uh, check that out at creating creativewritingcareer dot com, <laughs> and uh, listen in on what Justin, me and Justin and Stefan Bugai, uh, we. Sometimes it's just Justin. It's a little tougher these days for the three of us to, to get together and do the show. I don't know why. I have plenty of time. I don't know. Uh, I was doing quite a few podcasts there for a while. But we've been doing, Justin and I have been doing several uh, Just Us shows lately. So you can catch up on some of those. Uh, great show if you're, any any part of the uh, writing industry is covered. <clears throat> All creative writing. So not just indie publishing. So if you're looking for something, you know, on gaming, um, writing for film and television, um, anything creative, you can go check that show out and you'll, you'll find some great guests. So do that. Uh, now today's guest, uh, co-authored a book with Justin, uh, co-authored a series with Justin rather. Um, and, uh, you know, I talked to him about that and, and the rest of his work. And this is an interesting cat, man. He's got, he's got screenwriting background. He's got, uh, quite a prolific background, actually. So, I think you're going to enjoy the interview. Um, before we get into it, just one more quick thing. I forgot. I can't believe I forgot. But um, I have um, just a little bit. If you want to help out, by the way, with uh, Hurricane Harvey relief here in the Houston area, a- any area really. Uh, there were more areas than just Houston impacted by this, but. If you'd like to uh, help out, make donations or something along those lines, I have a link that I'm bo- posting on the uh, show notes for this episode. It's a bit.ly link, so that I could shorten it. Uh, it's bit.ly, bit.ly, slash Houston Beats Harvey, all one word. And I intercapitalized Houston Beats and Harvey. I don't know if that's going to matter, but uh, now that I think about it, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But uh, you can find the link on the show notes, but if you just go there... There are several several ways you can actually help out. Uh, the one that I've been pushing most is food. Uh, donate money so that people can buy food. The Houston Houston uh, Food Bank actually has the ability to, um, for every dollar you donate, they'll produce three meals. So I've been uh, I've been pushing that because there are so many people out there who they don't have homes, they don't have clothes, they don't have anything. Um, that stuff is being supplied in spades. There's been a huge outpour. It's amazing for me to hear these donation centers say, we actually don't need any donations right now. What we need is, you know, volunteers uh, to help with, uh, you know, although they want you to call ahead and schedule because they, they don't want everybody showing up at one time and not being effective. But they, so they need volunteers, um, people to take 
people in to their homes, uh, take in some evacuees who have no place to go. People have lost their homes. Uh, but, you know, food is going to be a high demand. Uh, one way or another, you know, everybody's got to eat. Uh, so that's the one that I, I chose as kind of my, that's the torch I carry. Um, so <clears throat> if you'll help out with that, I do appreciate it. God bless you for it. Uh, I've donated, I've donated quite a bit of money at this point. I've set up some, some things. I, I have an article that I ran on medium that was about sort of our, our spirit and reaction to this, uh, tragedy. Uh, and it has links to that and red cross. And, uh, so check that out, but go, go on to the show notes of this episode. But if you can go to bit.ly slash Houston beats Harvey, uh, that'll take you to, uh, that'll take you straight there. Uh, Stick around. I got some announcements uh, that uh, beyond storm related stuff. I got some things I'm going to announce regarding me and my work. Uh, maybe a little bit about the Wordslinger podcast in general. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to let's let's hop right in to this really great interview. Uh, I really enjoyed chatting with George. We're talking with George Mahaffey, and I'll see you on the other side. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. Uh, today I'm talking to somebody, okay, I'm going to admit that this guy was connected to me by someone you're very familiar with, Justin Sloan, friend of show, former guest, and co-host with me on the uh, Creative Writing Career Podcast. Uh, I'm talking to George Mahaffey. He's a screenwriter, but he's also a co-author of The Syndicate Wars with uh, Justin Sloan um, uh, um, and someone else. And I forget. And I and now I owe that guy an apology, George. What was, what was the other guy's <laughs> his, name? His, his name is Kyle Noe. <clears throat> Kyle Noe. Okay. So um, here we are. We got George on the line. And George, man, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. Hey, a real pleasure to be with uh, be here. Um, and Justin said nothing but great things, so I'm happy to be here. Well, he better, man. I pay the guy a lot. A lot. <laughs> he owes you, man. He owes. You. He does owe me. Um. So yeah. You, so you know. And I, we made we made this joke before the call started, really. But you know, I I had told you like who isn't a co-author with Justin Sloan, honestly, because the dude is just as long as I've known him, he's co-authored with people. No. I believe that he is a vampire that he does not sleep. Um, that's yeah. the only way that he's able to spit Look, out. Look, he's an ex-marine, man. That's right. That's right. <laughs> he's a, he's you know, Semper Fi, man. He's uh, he, he pushes it. Um, it's, it's battlefield conditions. He doesn't sleep. That's what it is. That's what it is. That's what it is. Uh, a couple kids. You know, his wife keeps him busy. Dude's doing some game writing. So, uh, tell me. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about Syndicate Wars. Then, is it like, sure. what's the story there? So what, what it is is <coughs> it's a very interesting. Uh, Interesting how it all sort of came to be. I, I was a screenwriter, uh, have sold some scripts to studios, including some big ones, and um, also written my own books. And then I was I knew I knew Kyle. I knew Kyle because Kyle and I actually um, we sold a, a TV show, an FBI TV show to, to Sony. Yeah. With Barry, with Barry Josephson producing, and Kyle knew Justin and said, "Hey man, Justin's writing this new book. It's about uh, it's, a, it's a Space Marines type book, but it's got a really cool, unique twist uh, with time travel." And I said, well, that sounds interesting. And so they sort of gave me, uh, you know, gave me the, the big picture on it. And we worked on an outline for a long, long time. Kyle did most of the work on the outline. He really came up with the story, the angle of it. I mean, it's really, really a great twist with time travel through the books. But it's largely, if you know some of the other books that are out there, Jay Allen writes a lot of the books, and uh, uh, Marta, Craig Martel and Michael Anderley sort of write a lot of the books, and Justin does as well. It's it's in that vein of the Space Marines. But it's it's a little bit different than any of the other books that are out there right now because it's got a really cool time time travel hook twist, which I'm not going to ruin. But Good. we're going to yeah. you know we've we've got <laughs> we've got two books out thus far. There's going to be six books, six or actually seven books in the series, and uh, you know we're going to we're we're gradually exploring the time travel thing. It's going to be really cool when we sort of bring it all full circle after about the fifth or sixth book. So yeah, that's sort of at the ten thousand foot level what it's about. Yeah, um, but we just you know we just just came out with it about uh, three weeks ago and it's doing really really well. It's been a bestseller so far, which is really great, and people have responded well to it, and it's been all good thus far. Yeah, so okay, so you're you're co-authoring with two other authors on the same book or just alternating books? Yeah, so what we're doing is it, it, look, it can be a little bit tricky. Who are we kidding? Anytime you have three people working on the same thing, you're asking for trouble. But so yeah. far, it's good. So I, I have generally written the majority of the first two and now I'm working on the third book you know when I say I've written the majority I do sort of the first draft you know whatever it is 65 or 70 thousand words 
and then the other guys come in and they edit it um, and they do their revisions and then I'll do another pass and we sort of keep doing the passes just to make sure that the voices are consistent yeah uh, and they have they have other ideas and 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 so it's all worked out. It's been great so far. I mean, they're putting in a lot of work. Justin's awesome with the sort of the marketing PR side of things, and Kyle, you know, essentially came up with the core story. So I mean, those guys are really putting in a lot of work, and it's been good so far. I mean, yeah. I, I, no complaints so far. Talk to me in like two months. Maybe I'll have complaints. But that's <laughs> yeah, you'll be on a clock tower somewhere. Those bastards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, we talked about this a little too, but I, I. I've tried co-authoring. You know, Nick and I can we can co-author together. Like we we've got a system now. I think I could probably find a system if I just did it. Uh, but this thing that Justin does, where you know he's basically he's built more or less a career around co-authoring. It's just not something that I am all that comfortable with. I think you know. It, I, you know, I, it depends on. The, it's all a personalities thing. I yeah, think. Yeah. And, you know, when you're and the other thing is when you're writing. Look, when you're in Hollywood, and that's that's where I came from. It's. I mean, you're literally writing a script, and then you right. have maybe, maybe five or ten other people who are constantly giving you notes right. and changing things, and you can't tell them, "Hey, you're an idiot. These things are terrible." Because they're gonna then they're just gonna immediately say, "Well, we're gonna move on to the next thing." So you have a have a good life. Yeah. So you've got to learn to be able. You have to learn to be able to work with people, and you know, and, and uh, you know, I think that that's a key thing. It's the personality thing, largely. Yeah, that's why I don't do screenwriting anymore. <laughs> it's tough. I mean, it's tough. Look, you know, it, I, I remember the first, first of, you know, one of the first, the first thing I ever went in a room on, I, I sold a pitch and I was like, this is the easiest business in the history of the world. And of course, it was never as easy after that. Right. But, you know, it's it's difficult because you have people who, you know, and what they say is they hire you because you have a certain voice in it. And as soon as they hire you, they want to change everything they liked about you. Right. And, and that's what, that's the beauty of the books. So, I, I mean, that's a, you know, I guess maybe we could, that's an interesting point to raise is why, you know, what's the difference between writing scripts and, and books, obviously, other than just the actual writing process, but it's largely about controlling your own property. And that's what attracted me to the books is I don't have five creative development, uh, you know, development execs or creative folks, you know, giving me ridiculous notes or asking me to change things they already changed a, a week before. It's totally different. I control right. the property. That's what's attractive about books to, to me, at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, how many books do you have uh, available right now? Well, I've got the two um, I've got the two Syndicate Wars books that are out right now. The third one will be out in about a month. Okay. Um, then, then I've got two other books with Justin that I that I largely wrote, but Justin's come aboard as well. There are actually three books. They're the Blood Runners trilogy. Now, they're going to be part of the Syndicate Wars world. Mm-hmm. And then after that, there's two other books called Broken Road, which are... Um, post-apocalyptic thrillers, also part of the Syndicate Wars world. We're going to tie it all in together. Those are the, all. Those other five books are coming out within the next like 45 to 60 days. Yeah, we've been working on them for a while. And then, uh, in addition to that, I have my own books, um, and they're largely horror books. They're all up on Amazon under under my name. Uh, I, I wrote four zombie books because, of course, everybody's got to write a zombie book. Um, yeah, and uh, some additional horror horror books as well. So I've got a bunch of them up there right now. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I see. Uh, I'm on your website. You know, I'm looking at a bunch of the, your covers, which mostly look like graphic novels, but they're these are not graphic novels, right? These are actual- no. I actually have a graphic novel. Co- I actually have a graphic novel coming out that we've been working on it for a while. A great artist for, from DC Comics is doing the art. This guy Christian Duce. Oh yeah. But it's, been, it's been a very, very, very. very I, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details on that, but that has not been a the the greatest uh, experience in the history of the world. It's, it's just taken. <laughs> Oh man! See now, that's the story I want to hear. You know, <laughs> it's. I mean, I could go into that if you want. I mean, that's an entirely different thing too. I mean, writing graphic novels is, is completely different because the way you, you know, you have to be able to, you know, say what would normally you could spend a paragraph writing. I mean, it has to be very concise. It's almost like on Twitter, and right, you yeah. have to con- you have to you have to condense everything, and then you have to talk to the artist, and the artist has to do it a certain way, and it's a very very difficult laborious you know this slow moving process it has not been it was it was initially fun and now it's not it, it's not fun anymore yeah you know but, i i i have so i have somehow some way i became connected to tons of comic book writers and artists um over the years and uh i, I it's on my bucket list to do a comic run at some point, you know, uh, to write something. But I've, I've they're studied. They're expensive. They're yeah. expensive to put together. I mean, I think yeah. our book costs like thirty grand. Oh yeah, you see, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, no, I know it's not cheap, man. It's not. It's it's nothing to kind of take lightly. You got to there's a lot of planning involved. Not just, you know, it's it, that is the great thing about writing books is that you know you can have a, a billion dollar 
you know budget story for just the cost yes. of the time to put it on paper. <laughs> Now, whether, now whether you're going to, I mean, then another issue is now is if you want to try to, because a lot of people write books hoping to sell them as movies or TV shows. Right. That's that's the downside to writing these big, huge space opera type things is that it's highly unlikely that you would ever get that made into a movie because of the budget reasons. Right. Right. Yeah. And the and the funny thing is, is the kind of script that you would be be able to write to actually probably get made. You could never write as a book because it would be too small and too contained. Right. So there's a, there's a there's a there's a rub there that a lot of people don't don't probably recognize. But yeah, 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 you know. yeah. That's why I don't I don't think it's a smart move actually to to write something with the intention of it being on film later. You know? I, no, I, I don't think so either. I mean, unless you there, there's some there's some stuff where you can sort of hit the sweet spot. I think that there's a you know there's a space for sort of post apocalyptic uh, things that you might be able to do for like between thirty and fifty million dollars something like right, that. But right. you know. The idea that you would just go out and, and write something like that in the hopes of selling it, you, you don't want to do that. Right. That doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yeah. No. Just get write write get the story down. Get it get it and make it the best story you can make it and then life will and take make a, over. And make, and, yeah, and make a little <laughs> and make it a little bit different and, and you look they you know, the studios want a twist, a hook, some commercial hook. And I think you need that really for the books because you know, you need to distinguish your book and differentiate it from everything out there because there's a tons of books out there. How many books yeah. are on Amazon? Eight million or something like that. <laughs> you have to have you have to do things a little bit differently, right. just as you would just as you would if writing and writing a, a, a script. And we can talk about any of that stuff. I'm more yeah, than no. happy to talk about any of the screenwriting stuff and my adventures in the uh, screen screenwriting business. All yeah. that stuff. So your on your Amazon uh, homepage, you put one of your you put uh, Blood Runners designated survivors as your cover photo. That's one you've done with Justin. Yes, right. correct. Yeah, is the that first out, one's or is that no, no, not yet. Okay. So the first one's the first one. That's the second book. The first book is called Absolution. It's Blood Runners Absolution. That will be out on June the twenty fourth. Okay. Uh, we'll then also have a standalone short story. That's I think it's going to be free. I believe it's going to be free. And then we're going to have the second book come out a month after that, and then the third book come out after that. Very cool. Yeah. So, so how yeah, are you? Yeah. Uh, oh, no. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Please, please. Well, first, first question. I think if I remember right. You had already written Absolution, and you approached Justin. Is that how that worked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That worked. I mean, I, so, I'm curious about that. <laughs> yeah, I tell, I tell you. So th this is the one thing. So when you're writing scripts, you know, a, a lot of the if you're writing the post-apocalyptic stuff or even the thriller stuff, a lot of it's very dark, especially yeah. the script stuff. For some reason, you know, I, I mean, obviously Guardians of the Galaxy has sort of changed the equation a little bit, but before that. People didn't like the the sort of the snarky, jokey stuff. Other than you know, you had some exceptions. Joss Whedon did some exceptions and stuff like that. But they liked the dark stuff. Yeah. So when I wrote the first draft of it, the damn book, it was too dark. And you know, here's the, and I and I thought one day after Justin said, you know what, people don't want to read books and be depressed. And some people do, but the people, but the percentage of the audience that does want to read something that's really, really dark, it's pretty small. Yeah. Um. So I, you know, I, I have some of the darker horror stuff for people that like that stuff, but I wanted to sort of lighten it up. A little bit. I mean, and not make it funny, but just you know, make it you know, make it not make it so dark. And yeah. I think that that's one of the things he's really good at. Is he's re he's you know he's able to come aboard and and sort of lighten things up without losing what you liked about the book to begin with. Right. And I think we were able to do that. That's not easy to do, but I think we we've, we've been able to do that on on Blood Runners to make it a little bit more palatable for more people. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, I dig the uh, the covers. They've got a nice vibe. I mean, it's very post apocalyptic. It seems dark. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Yeah. Without being. I mean, look. I mean, me, me personally, the stuff I was writing with scripts that people asked me to write. I mean, it was a lot. It was the stuff was dark, and uh, right. the covers that the covers that a guy would like, um, you know, or, or somebody in, the, in Hollywood would like. I mean, they're they're much darker than those covers. Those covers are actually fairly light. I mean, if you if you look online, there's tons of covers that are much darker than that. And, right. Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to stay I wanted to stay away with stay away from that because I don't think people want to read you know those kinds of things which are you know so so doom and so much doom and gloom. It's like people right. have enough problems that don't want to read that stuff. Right. 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 For the, for the most part, for the most part, there are some people that like that stuff. I personally dig that stuff sometimes too. Uh, so it's all good, but I think in you know in this situation, what Justin sort of brought to the table is he was able to lighten the mood in the book. I guess that's the, yeah. the best way to put it. Yeah. So how are you? Uh, how are you marketing these? Well, Justin does a lot of that. I mean, he's he's excellent at excellent as a marketer. He can have a separate career just as a marketer, um, and that's one of the differences between sort of screenwriting and writing books is 
you do have to know the market. You do have to have these relationships with people. You do have to know what works and what doesn't. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, these guys, I mean, Justin writes books with Michael Anderley and all these other writers. They have built-in audiences, and oftentimes it's you're able to tap into those audiences. And that is something that I did not know before I got uh, before I started writing with Justin is, I mean, he's really taught me about all of that stuff in the same way that, you know, when you begin anything, so when you begin, you know, working as a screenwriter or something, you don't know anything. I mean, you, yeah. you don't know about relationships. You don't know anything. You can read the books and all of that stuff, and there's a couple of good books out there, but most of it's like stuff you have, it takes you years to learn. Right. And so, you know, Justin's basically, I've learned like three or four years worth of stuff in like three months with working with him. Right. Uh, so he has done an excellent job marketing that stuff through personal relationships and through various websites. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Justin has spent a, quite a bit of time learning the uh, the value of leveraging someone's audience. <laughs> he's yeah, pretty, he's, he's like a, pretty he's good like, at. It. He's a bo- he's like a book sherpa, you know, maybe that could be his, his next <laughs> book website. Sherpa. That's what I'm calling Booksherpa.com. it. Booksherpa.com. I just copyrighted that, by the there way. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and you're an attorney, right? So you Unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. No, Don't you, hold that against me. Every attorney I ever meet uh, talks about the days when he's not going to be an attorney anymore. <laughs> Because <laughs> nobody likes it's a thankless job and nobody likes them and yeah. most and here's the thing most attorneys they don't listen they talk and, and I'm not going to go off on a tangent on that but <laughs> that's the biggest problem is people don't like generally they don't like people who won't shut the hell up it's, yeah and I've learned that it's like I I listen now I mean it probably sounds like I'm talking fast but I listen you, you have to listen more and and shut up right and that's the biggest problem <laughs> so right right yeah yeah that's it is tricky, and uh, yeah, it's not just lawyers who do that. <laughs> no, but they're particular. They're particularly bad at it, and they yeah. a lot of them are, are, were unsuccessful at other things, and that makes them unpleasant to begin with. And uh, you know, so we could go on for hours about that. But what's that? <laughs> all right, we'll move on. All right, so um, uh, all right, so Justin's handling a lot of the marketing for you. You've, you guys are co-authoring. Sort of, he's sort of coming in at. I, I, I think it's an interesting concept. That you bring in a co-author after the book is complete, I actually kind of like that because it's it seems to me like it's it's uh, the perfect you know co-authoring scenario. Like I get to write the book and then uh, and finish it and complete it, and then someone else comes along and just adds their touches. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, that's sort of what we you know we envisioned it, and I'm trying to think. I actually had a really good thought on this, and now it sort of sort of slipped my mind, but it's, it's, I was going to make, it was analogous to another situation in business, and now really I can't think of it, but it's, you know, it's sort of like, it's sort of like, you know, if you're doing, almost like you're, be, you're getting ready to do an IPO, and you've got, you know, the three key members of an initial public offering, an IPO, or accountants, then the uh, financial people, and then the lawyers, and you sort of bring one of these guys, you bring one group of, of men or women aboard to add their flair to it, yeah. help the things succeed. That's sort of what you think of it, because really, I mean, that's what a book is. It's, a, it's You're launching basically a new business and a new product every time you put a book up. So it's not unlike an IPO to a certain extent. I mean, I, I sort of do think of it in business terms sometimes. So so Justin's basically like a consultant to, to a certain extent. Yeah. I think that's, a, that's an appropriate way to think about it. I mean, you're, you know, it's a, it's like launching a very, a very tiny micro, you know, startup. You know? <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, just just like a, just like a script is. I mean, I was talking to a producer yesterday, and the script that I wrote for him, and you know, he said it's like a puzzle. You have to put the pieces together, and yeah. you know, some, sometimes those pieces include bringing in people who know stuff that you don't, because God knows, I don't, I don't, you know, there's, I, I don't, there's the amount of stuff I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's shocking. Yeah. So it's always helpful to bring somebody aboard who knows what the hell they're doing. And so he knows that. What's uh what what has trans transferred from your screenwriting experience uh, into novel writing? Well, the first thing is is the first thing is the ability to is dialogue and action action yeah. stuff. So you know the dialogue is going to be somewhat on the. I, I mean, it's just it's very easy. It's just been an easy transition, particularly on the dialogue and the writing of the action because. What I was what I was doing before when I was screenwriting is I sold a big action script to Paramount and Michael Bay was producing it and Timur the guy Timur Bekmambetov who directed uh, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer and a bunch of other movies he was going to direct it so I became very familiar with being able to write huge set pieces you know yeah. what, what's called screenwriting set pieces and action scenes and write them sort of in a different way make you feel like you were in that and I think that that's one of my strengths it, and, and it transferred over into books because now I get to write even more detailed stuff when I do this which I wasn't able to do with screenwriting so 
I mean, that stuff's fun, and a lot of people have difficulty being able to choreograph all the action stuff. That's just something that came naturally to me. And, and I think the ability to write dialogue of a certain kind, um, yeah. a certain fashion, I think that that is... And the ability to write quickly. I mean, you have to write fast if you're writing a script for a producer or something. You have, you have to write it quickly, and right. it has to be good. You have to be, So you have to be fast, and you have to be good. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, that brings up... So uh, what is what has been your turnaround? Like, how, how many words are you uh, hitting with each book? Uh, the books are between 65 and probably 75,000 okay. words, okay. and I think we were able to do that in about 35 to 40 days. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's about, um, that's about average. I mean, you know, look, if you're a traditional author or a traditional uh, a, a agented book, you'd, yeah. you'd think that's ridiculous. You know, that's insane. Oh, yeah, that's be, true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's I, at minimum six months. You know? Right. Yeah, and, I uh, uh, I have a real problem remembering sometimes that um, you know indies have the ability to do that. Uh, to, the traditional world tends to take a year to write a book. <laughs> right, right, and and I think that you know I mean it, the the thing that we're trying to do is you know somebody I guess here's another analogy is it's almost like you know when you watch like a TV show like Diners, Drive-ins, and Dives or whatever, and they yeah. go to a dive bar and the guy's like, we're giving you you know fine dining. You know, the, the equivalent fine dining service in a dive bar. And that's sometimes what we're hoping for with these books is that somebody might come along and they might say, well, it's an indie published book. It's like basically like a dive bar. And, and our thought was, you know, well, we're trying to, you know, elevate, you know, the level of what's in that book, even if it is a dive, so that you're getting basically like fine dining in the book. And, and we hope we're doing that with these books. I mean, we've got, you know, Justin and Kyle were both in the Marines, so they bring a, a level of authenticity that somebody who wasn't in the military you know, might not have. Right. And then, and then I'm, you know, coming from screenwriting where I'm, you know, basically coming in with the experience of being able to write these huge battle scenes and action scenes. So we're hoping that it all comes together in, in a manner that people like. And some people might not like it, but some people might think it stinks. And that's, it's all good because, you know, it's very subjective and, you know, somebody could read it and think it's great and somebody else could think it stinks. And, you know, we've all done that. And that's, that's cool. And that's great. Just, yeah. You know, it's all good. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's kind of well. It's interesting the the discussion of how your your comparison of the books to a dive bar, right? Like I, I can already hear some people rankling at the <laughs> at the comparison, but I I kind of did. I'm not, and I'm not I'm not comparing. I'm not in. No, no, I know, that. man. No, I know. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. They're not. They're not dive. Just because somebody does an indie indie book and publishes it, yeah. publishes it themselves does not mean it is crappy. Yeah. Or any, and I'm not suggesting that in any manner. My right. only thought was they're doing it on their own. You know, they're no, and I, sometimes doing it bare bones, right. just no, like somebody I, in a small place. And that's I, I feel you, man. I, I the way I the way I see that is, you know, some of my favorite you know places to eat are dive bars, right? I mean, you you go and you get the best for you get something that is exactly what you're looking for, but you're not surrounded by. Um, pomp and circumstance you know but i guess the the thing that i think about um with indie versus traditional is that you know a lot of times you've got some really high-end stuff and the only thing differentiating it is it didn't go through a gatekeeper you know absolutely absolutely and i mean think about this the other thing is books traditional books are damn expensive right and a lot of people don't have the ability to pay 15 or 25 bucks for a for a freaking book right and right. They're, they're going to get the same book you know you read any of the books that are put i mean hugh howie basically started a lot of it and sean platt and a lot of those guys and, yeah. and, and joe, joe conrath all the people sort of came before it there those are great books and the enderlay books are great books and justin's books and martell's and and Jay Allen's and everybody else, all the people I'm not mentioning. I mean, those are good effing books. Yeah. And you're getting them for a very reasonable price. And so, I hope nobody will take offense when I said dive bar. I didn't mean that the books are <laughs> crappy. They're great. They're great no, books. All I meant, no all I meant was they're doing sense. it. No, they're doing. They're doing it. You know, they're doing it. Sort of bootstrapping the books for the most right. part. Some of them, some of them aren't, but they're doing it the best way that they can. And the audience, I think, loves that because the audience who are reading these books, they like these books. Yeah. And the well-written yeah. books as a good value. And yeah. I think that that's the most important thing. And the people, the authors, by the way, are very accessible. And yeah. it's not like some of the other people who are not, who are, you know, they're, oh, they're too good to talk to the, to the people who actually read the books. We're not, we're not like that at all. I mean, hell, you can Facebook us anytime you want or you exactly. can email me if you want. Yeah. People yeah. on screen, they can email me. I don't, that's fine. I'll get back to them. Right. Um, 
so that's all I meant. You know, as I as that's what's really no, fun I, and interesting I think about that's, it. Yeah, no, nobody. I don't think anybody's going to take offense at that. I, I think uh, actually, it's kind of a badge of pride for for me. I I know more and more people who are only reading indie books. Um, sure. Just because you know, one, it's economical. I mean. Like you said, I, I, it's crazy what they're doing with pricing on ebooks uh, through the uh, traditional world. You know, where you, they're asking me to pay like fifteen to twenty bucks for an ebook. A lot of money. That's yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. Especially I mean, when the paperback of... is like half the price. You know, that's just offensive. <laughs> and, and and some of it, look, and times are still tough. I mean, you know, and a lot of people don't have the money for fifteen or twenty bucks, but they do have you know two ninety nine or three ninety nine. And, right. and if for eight, for eighty thousand words, I think that that is a good value. No, yeah, I agree. I agree. So you're, uh, what, what, what's, what's sort of your general philosophy of, of the work? Like, what is it you're trying to do with your, your actual writing career overall? Well, I mean, I'm just trying to, to write stories that are a little bit different than what people have seen before. And, and okay. that's when I'm looking at an idea. It's, it's fine. You know, and the, the term I've used is one before, and this is not a term that somebody used to me when I first started screenwriting, is refreshingly familiar. And that's what they said that they're looking for, and a lot of people are looking for, which is well, we sort of know the world. I've seen the world before, but this is a, doing it a little bit differently. It's got a little bit different angle, a little bit different hook. And if and if you can hit that, and I was actually telling that to somebody today, if you can do that, then I think you're really on to something. And I think that that's what interested me about the Syndicate Wars book is I, books. As I have seen the world before. I've seen the Space Marine stuff. I like that stuff. I like it. But this, you know, Kyle's idea, Justin's idea with the time travel stuff, it was a little bit different. Yeah. Than than what some of the other folks were doing, and and once people I think get to the fifth or sixth book to see sort of how it all comes full circle, I think it's I think it's really unique and really interesting, and that's what attracted me to it. So I like to tell those kinds of stories, um, you know, and and I don't like cliche for the most part, and so I'll try to write characters that are the opposite of what people are expecting. Right. Um, and I've done that in some of my, some of my books. It's like you know you. It's just you know, there's some tropes that you've got to use a lot of times, but you know some of the cliches. It's like this, the, the characters in the books are the same, and I always like the books, even if they're the story's not there. If the characters are really different and unique, I mean that's sort of what I, I'm striving for is to try to come up with those books where people are like, well, that's a little bit different than I thought it was going to be, yeah. or I haven't read I haven't read something like that before. I mean that's my hope. I don't know if I get there. But yeah. that's just you know, <laughs> what my hope is. So do you do you uh, plot an outline? Yeah, I mean, so we had about a 25,000 word outline for the Syndicate Wars world. I think Kyle spent two months on that uh, damn thing. But that's and for a I've series. Got, that's not for one book. That's for an entire series. No, no. So, okay. so the book, so, so the book would probably be each page, each uh, book would probably be about a five, three to five page outline. Yeah. Um, and we did plot out the, I did bios and backstories and stuff like that for the main characters. Um, you know, and you know, oftentimes you think of, well, what are they? Are they sort of uh, similar to characters we've seen before? And so, in the Syndicate Wars book, there's the female lead is named Quinn, and then there's a there's a, a doctor um, who's who's named Cody. And so, I envisioned them. I always thought of them as sort of the two leads on Bones. Oh yeah, okay. You know, that, that back that back and forth, but reversed. So the guy is the guy is Bones, and then Quinn, the mer- female Marine, is is Booth, is the is the male lead. Yeah. And so that that sort of helps because you can say, hey, they're just like that. And we do, and I used to do that all the time in screenwriting, where somebody would say, well, how do you see the characters? And you say, well, they're just like so and so, but but different. Yeah. And so that you know that's that's the way to that's the way we sort of approach the characters and the plotting and stuff like that. And we had mini bios for everybody, and um, you know some of the stuff changes. I mean, that's one of the tricky things in in writing six or seven books is. You know, a couple of times we slipped up on some small details, and we had to go back and change things—things things that we didn't notice before. We just glossed over. But right. um, you know, yeah, yeah. So you do you cast your uh, your stories? Like you you go and find photos and you know whatever. Well, again, I, I think we do. I think we work off. I think in a general sense we do. But okay. I mean, that was my. But you don't have like my... a file of. You know, here's a picture of Tom Cruise, and he represents. No, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, okay. I, I do have a gigantic file. It's actually right here on my desk next to me, but not not of that. I mean, you know, the one thing I, I like to do when I when I write the books is I I don't want to get bogged down in like Tom Clancy like granular details about weapon systems and stuff like that right. because I used to, I used to like his books, but that was always something that sort of turned me off a little bit was that it was like too much detail. But you don't want to you don't want to lose some of the details where somebody who actually knows the stuff will read it and say these guys don't know what the hell they're talking about. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think sometimes I probably spend a little bit too much detail, uh, you know, reading up on well how would how would a battle in space be? 
you know, what kind of weapon systems would they be, would they use? And so we try to, I've been doing a lot of that, you know, sort of going back and trying to make sure it's at, it's at least possible, you know, so we don't lose some of the, some of the detail. But in terms of actually like having pictures of characters, we, we don't, we don't do that. Not yet, at least. Right. Sorry for the uh, barking. I, my That's okay. Dog. I don't know what she's freaking out about. Actually, that's that, that doesn't <laughs> typically happen. She doesn't like the interview, right? <coughs> yeah. So, um, and that was Minnie, everybody, um, <laughs> who is going to continue to be on the show. Apparently, um, that completely threw me off. So uh, we'll just make up a conversation from here. So you, uh, you don't, or you do plot, or you do outline at least. Uh, you don't cast. Okay, those were the two things that were on my brain. Well, so a lot of times I'll just a lot of times I'll just. This is the one thing I always did when I was since when I was screenwriting. Is I will see the characters and then essentially, I mean, I sound like a lunatic, but you'll hear them talking. Right. And, and I just write dialogue. Like a lot of times I'll just write pages and pages of dialogue and try to make it as you know, and then you know, actually print it off and then cross through the stuff that doesn't work and try to get it as concise and tight as possible, but also funny and, and make it sound authentic because, you know, dialogue is sort of st- a stylized version of what we hope people will sound like. Right, yeah. Not necessarily what they do sound like. And so, you know, I, I think that we want to do that. We wanted to make these books. Of, we don't. These books are not dark. I mean, there's a lot of action and adventure and stuff like that, but, you know, they're fun books, and we wanted to have the dialogue reflect that to make it more sort of in the veins of Gal- uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, is, I, I don't know. I, I, saw, I recently saw a quote. Uh, I saw a like a short snippet from Aaron Sorkin. I think it was for like his master class or something where he's, he the, said, he's uh, the best. Yeah. He is. When it comes to dialogue, man, no way beats Aaron Sorkin. I mean, there, <laughs> yeah, no, nobody, nobody beats him. I mean, there's other, there's other people who are close who, you know, who do really, really well with yeah. writing dialogue. I mean, Joss Whedon does well. Yeah. yeah. I like Joss Whedon. Uh, but, Joss Whedon but, is and, more my style. <laughs> I mean, and Sorkin, look, Sorkin can be somewhat, sometimes some people think it's condescending and so forth and so on. And some of the scripts are better than others, but if you read, but some of it's just great. I mean, like Charlie Wilson's War, which a lot of people didn't see. Yeah, it's is good. Great is is a great script. Yeah, um, it's good. I really enjoyed it. It was uh, uh, it was well done. I mean, all around it was well done. I um, cut you off though. You were mentioning you saw a snippet from Alan. Sorkin. No, yeah, no. He he was saying, uh, what was he saying? Oh, he was saying that uh, it was just part of his advice for dialogue, and he says um, nobody ever says "damn it" and someone's name like. Damn it, Bob! You know, no one yeah. ever actually says that. <laughs> so, so, I uh, that was just throwing that in there as a kind of an aside. I mean, people, people do, and people don't sound like that. Nobody, no, nobody says dialogue what the is, hell. Are, yeah, yeah. No. Most people, most people don't say what the hell are you doing. They say the hell are you, the hell are you doing? Yeah. And so, you know, there's a there's some class out there where the guy says immediately cut off the first word that you're going to use in almost every sentence because it won't it won't be realistic. I don't know if that's entirely accurate, <laughs> but. You know, I mean, that's it, you know, and, and like you said, there's just a way of doing it, and and the thing is, it turn it goes full circle to what I said about before about lawyers not listening. Right. You have to listen. The greatest dialogue I've ever heard is when I sit in airports and I just listen to people talk because yeah, that's, that's when you really hear. Like one time I was sitting in the airport in Atlanta or something like that, and I listened to a group of, of mattress salesmen. Yeah. It was the most interesting conversation I have ever heard in my life. Yeah, yeah. And and I literally was writing stuff down as they were talking. So that's the way you, you learn dialogue is by, you know, listening to what people how people really talk. And then the other thing is as a lawyer, I read transcripts. I've read I used to read transcripts every day, trial transcripts, deposition transcripts. Right. That is how you, that's a great way of learning how to uh, how to write dialogue because that is how people true it's an unfiltered look at how people truly talk. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, I never really thought about it. I spent I I have spent hours and hours reading transcripts for documentary film work. So there you go. I, I mean, that's it. a great and that's a great tip. For yeah, that's people, a, that's a good idea. Yeah, is is to is to look at transcripts because they'll they'll lose people lose the filler words when they're actually being asked to to answer questions. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I I I, I don't I I do very well with dialogue. I actually dialogue is a, is a strength of mine. So I. <coughs> Uh, but I couldn't tell you like how I got there. I'm gonna have to sit and analyze that now, you know, uh, put it down on paper because someone's gonna ask me now, uh, guaranteed. Well, you know, but you know it. I mean, but you know it when you read it. You know, you know when you when you read dialogue, yeah, it's not yeah. authentic. You no, know, you know it. I mean, it's yeah. like you know, it's, it's like the definition of pornography. You, you Justice know Potter, you know, know when you see it, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. No. Yeah. No. I and I think uh, honestly, uh, the the trick to to good dialogue is rhythm. You know, like absolutely cadence. Yeah. There's a cadence. The cadence. That's what Sorkin has. Yeah. Sorkin's exactly. got the cadence. 
cadence. It's it's almost like you know you're rhyming. Yeah. And it's just fits perfectly. And you know, and, and Mamet does it. David Mamet does it. And yeah. I think he was the, so Mamet was the first person I ever read. Even when I was like when I was a somebody gave me a Mamet play. It may have been Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, or whatever. But that was the first time I ever read something. I was and I thought to myself, my God, this guy's. He's doing something a little bit different, and and it's and it's awesome. Yeah. And you know, how, how can I write like this? And so I, I think that's sort of the first person who turned me on to the idea that you could write stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So who are so, some of your your biggest influences then? I think well, I think Mammoth is. I think Sorkin is. I mean, I, I think uh, you know, in the commercial, and, and and Martin Amos is another awesome writer. Christopher Hitchens, who's now dead, used to be. Uh, he's a great writer too. I mean. Uh, he was a great, you know, used to get, he wrote the book, you know, God is not great and a bunch yeah. of other books. It was very controversial. It's now dead, but great writer. Martin Amos is an English writer, great writer. A lot of people don't like him because he writes totally different, completely different to other people. I mean, Dickens, of course, uh, you know, was a great writer. Um, there's another writer from DC, Lewis Bayard, who wrote a book on Tiny Tim, believe it or not. He yeah. wrote a, he wrote an entire book on how, what Tiny Tim would have been like almost in an alternative universe alternative world great book I mean that guy is a great great writer uh, and in terms of like the more commercial writers I mean obviously look Stephen King is a great writer uh, Grisham you know I, there's some books of his I've read that I didn't particularly like but I think all in all he's a great writer um, you know the guy who wrote the Lincoln the Lincoln lawyer uh, Michael Connolly right yeah, Michael, Michael Connolly yeah. Michael Connolly's a great writer Stephen Hunter used to be the uh, the uh, uh, film critic for the Post is a great action writer, and then you've got people who you know Anderley and Martell and and Jay Allen and all of these guys who are writing the book. These guys are are serious writers, and they write really great commercial stories that are really really interesting. So, yeah. I mean, I like I like all of that stuff. But if you're, you know, you look at you read different things for different. Like I have a handful of scripts that I think are excellent, fabulous action scripts. Yeah. And I'll always go back to those and I'll look to see well how did they do it because I really think they did it in a different way. Same thing for dialogue. You want to go back and you want to you want to have maybe like five or six things that you always look at to say, well, well you know they really got it right. They have the cadence. They have the rhythm. And and same with books. I mean, you know you have the same people you sort of go back to to see how they did it. Uh, yeah. People that you learn from. So I mean a whole whole but and also music. I mean if you read I like reading lyrics sometimes to songs just to see a different way of putting things. I think that that's yeah. important too because oftentimes dialogue and stuff like that it's very similar to to the beats in a song yeah uh, so all different yeah. stuff yeah no i uh no that's cool i i i did not take as i've taken like formal writing classes you know but i i learned more just from reading widely which i think is what most most often most writers come to that i think i, th- I think i think so i think so i think i you know and that's a good good point you just raised i did take formal writing classes a lot of them i also had a friend who was the who still is the screenwriting professor at yale yeah. and johns hopkins this guy mark lapadula just justin actually studied with him as well good screen, excellent screenwriting co- uh teacher and I, i've dealt with some other guys as well and the what they taught me is i do think it's sometimes it's good to have a screenwriting coach even though a lot of people are like ah you don't want to pay somebody to to teach or whatever it might be 500 bucks or 750 bucks or whatever but what they can do is they're not going to teach you how to write but what they're going to do is they're going to basically hone the skills you already have and tell you what to write so that it's more commercial if that's what you want to do. Right. And that's what I wanted. That's what I want to do is I wanted to write stuff that I, I thought was a qual- quality writing, but in a commercial t- kind of story. And uh, and those screenwriting coaches really pushed me in the direction of well, do you want to write something for yourself or do you want to write something that might actually sell? And uh, <laughs> they did help me. To, they did help me to write something that sold a bunch of things. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a tough question to answer. Because the answer it for is. me is always I want to write for myself, but I'm not. You a do. I mean, you do. I mean, well, well. Look, here's the deal. There's di- there's a difference between the screenwriting and the books. In the screenwriting, you really can't write uh, for yourself necessarily because right. I mean, you you can and you can't. You can write the screenplays for yourself, but unless you have millions of dollars, you know, generally speaking, if it's a really small non-commercial story, they're not going to make it. Especially in this day and age, with the emphasis on underlying IP, intellectual property, superheroes, the Marvel stuff, all that stuff. It's very difficult to get anything made. But a right. book, you can write you can write anything and you can put put that great story up there and you can write it for yourself and it doesn't necessarily have to be commercial. And by the way, there's no reason why you need to write something that's commercial. That's just what, you know, interested me is I I do I do like those commercial stories and God knows I've written lots of stuff that was not the first 12 screenplays I ever wrote were high, were not even remotely commercial. Yeah. Uh, but I wrote them because I thought they were cool stories, and uh, you know nothing happened with any of them. Right. Um, so. 
Are you so you are you still actively uh, screenwriting? Yeah, I just wrote yeah. a script for. Uh, I just wrote a, a contained home invasion thriller, which is which was a little unique for uh, for one of the producers uh, who's done a couple of movies and. You know, we're hoping that it gets made and starts filming in September, but you know, you never know. Yeah. Never know. <laughs> That's the other thing, <laughs> man. <Famous> last words. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, like, like most writers, I grew up kind of thinking, you know, it would be very cool to write a movie. It would be very cool to write a television episode or something along those lines. And, and, it, and it is. And it is cool, yeah. I mean, I worked in TV, so, I, you know, I got a chance to, to see my work on screen, but um, I, I, I became pretty disillusioned with all of it like at this point if someone approached me and said you know we want to make a movie out of your dan collar books i would say um that's great where when do i get the check and i'm taking yes. a vacation while you do it you know and then they would and then they would say about that whole check thing <clears throat> yeah yeah exactly i mean li- literally look I-, I will tell you kevin i mean i've had i've had i had contracts with people yeah and they're just like we can't do it and i said well why do you even have a bother to have a contract and right i mean I ha- i've had one script and it's probably the most commercial script I've ever I've ever written. Literally, three or four people guaranteed that yeah. they would they, they would. I have contracts. I still have the contracts, and just everything fell through. You know, a direct. I had a had a script I wrote for uh, director Paul McGuigan, who's written a bunch of big movies, and just he decided just to bail at the last minute. So yeah, that went no, away. it happens. Yeah, we were. We, it sucks. We had a project that. Um, I mean, I'm not I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but I mean, we had a project that was, had a lot of big names already attached to it. I mean, it was all green, and then just fell apart just before it started. I mean, it just never went anywhere. It's amazing. It's and, yeah. and it's very. It's you know what you want to what you don't want to do is let's say you start screenwriting seriously in your 30s. You don't yeah. want to look. Around, you don't want to look around and say, "Hey, I'm 42 or 43 or whatever," and, and I don't have any. I don't have any credits. Nothing's been produced, and now, you know, what do I do? And and I think yeah. that that's why, you know, if you're obviously look, if you're able to sell stuff, great and all that good stuff. But, you know, in terms of, I, I just, I just really love the idea of being able to control my own property. I thought that that was a really great thing. I, I continue to do that. I think that that's more and more just among the creative class. Music, you know, whatever, whatever you want. Even the guy, look, the guy who's going to be, you know, who might be drafted, the, the, you know, Lonzo Ball, the basketball player, and right. his dad. If he's a sports, I mean, he created his own shoe. He's got his own company because he wanted to control everything. I mean, that guy's crazy. But you know, you get the idea that more and more people are wanting to control their own property, and I think that there's that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's the heart of the indie publishing world, you know. I mean that's that the whole idea is to get away from gatekeepers and get out there and tell the story that that you know you intended to tell. Yeah, and a lot of look a lot of these I mean you look at the success of, of all these writers, you know, Sean Platt and Anderley and Justin and uh, you know Martel and Alan and everybody else, they know their audience and they know that the stories are going to be successful and if you had a gatekeeper, the gatekeeper will probably say, "Well, you need to change this and do all these other things." And they're essentially saying, "No, I don't. I know who my audience is and I know what right. kind of story they like." Right. And I'm doing it my I'm doing it my way. That's right. And uh, you know, and I think that that's empowering. I think that's really cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, we're we're at time, man, uh, which is is kind of unfortunate. Uh, but it's been great chatting with you, buddy. I, I'm glad to have you on the show. And I know you and Justin are going to continue working together, so we'll probably cross paths. Um, anytime, anytime. I love it, man. I mean, I can, I can keep talking for a half hour, two hours, but it's all good. Yeah, I know, man. That's that's me too. I I specifically have to start a timer to so that I don't start just <laughs> <laughs> blabbing all over the place. But absolutely. Uh, anyway, uh, tell people where they can find you online, man. Well, they can definitely find me on on Amazon. You can go to George Mahaffey. You can go to I've got a website as well. Uh, I need to update the website a little bit, but it is it's it, everything's up there. And then if look if people want to email me screenwriting questions. They can email, feel free to email me. I'm not one of those people who's going to say no. You can't email me if people yeah. have screenwriting book questions. You know, you can email me at gsm at gdldlaw.com, or you can just look online and find me. And feel free if you want to email me, I'll be more than happy. I can't tell you I'll email you back within the next you know half hour after you email me, but I will get back to you. <laughs> Good deal, man. All right, and of course, everybody listening, you can pick up uh, links to the, his website, uh, Facebook page, Amazon author page, all that stuff. And we do, and we do have a great, we do have a great uh, a Syndicate Wars Facebook page. And all you have to do on Facebook is just type in Syndicate Wars, and it'll pop right up. Oh, very cool. Okay. Yep. All right. All right. Well, you can find all that in the show notes. And uh, other than that, stick around, and we'll do the uh, wrap up at the end of the show. And George, thanks for being on, man. Hey, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. All right. See you, everyone, just after this little musical interlude. 
All right. I hope you enjoyed that interview with George Mahaffey. Um, great guy. He actually was a great guy. And uh, I, I actually very much enjoyed uh, chatting with him. Um, I think what he and Justin are doing is kind of cool. I think what he's doing with his career is kind of cool. And it's, uh, like I say, a little bit different. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so, you know, here, this, this last portion of the show is always about uh, housekeeping, wrapping things up. Uh, letting you know what's going on in the, the world, life, and career of the Wordslinger. Um, so, among other things, I got a, a cool promotion coming up. Now, I, you may have heard me talk about BookBub in the past. And if you're an indie author, you, there's a very good chance you've heard of BookBub. You may even have landed some BookBub promotions. I have never landed one. Uh, <laughs> I've never. I've tried a few times. Um, so, what I'm going to admit here is that I kind of just didn't try that much. Um I tried a handful of times. Each time I released a new book, I tried to, to get one uh, to help with the promotion. Just never could land one um, and just sort of just wrote it off because I have this personal philosophy, you will say. <laughs> about, I just don't like the idea of, of begging someone to take my money. You know, and then being told no. <laughs> so I'm a little stubborn. Uh, you may know that about me by now. But um, now my good friend Nick Thacker is always talking me into this. Now that dude just lands book bubs all the time. Um, no trouble. No idea why. Uh, but he pushed me and said, hey, man, you need to try again. Go go back. You know, I'm, here I am. I'm your Jiminy Cricket or uh, something similar anyway. Uh, go do this. So he nudged me. I went it. Uh, and I got one. So now that if you're listening to this on release day, it's Friday the first. Um, my book bub officially is on Sunday the third, <clears throat> which means two days from now. Um, but little secret, um, I'm only sharing with you guys and my mailing list. <laughs> uh, I I went ahead and I made the book free. And the, the, the book I'm promoting is The Atlantis Riddle. It's, it's, it's the second Dan Kotler book. You can pick up that series from any book, though. Um, but if you haven't read the others and you'd like to, <clears throat> here's what's going on. I set the book for free for the next couple of days for the book, Bub. Uh, and then I went ahead and set a promotion, a Kindle countdown, actually, for both, uh, both of the full-length Dan Kotler books uh, tied to... Atlantis Riddle. So the Coelho Medallion or Coelho Medallion, <laughs> depending on who you are. Uh, but the Coelho Medallion is available for, it'll be starting off 99 cents. Uh, every couple of days it's going to pop up like about a dollar uh, until it gets back to its full price at 4.99 on, I believe, Friday. Um, and also the follow-up, the most recent Dan Kotler book is The Devil's Interval, also starting out at 99 cents and, and hiking up every couple of days until it gets back to um, full price. So right now is the time, man. Uh, now, I set that all to start on tomorrow, the 2nd of September. So um, you can get right now. I mean, not now, uh, but starting tomorrow, you can get Atlantis Riddle for free. And you can get the other two full-length books in that series Um for 99 cents so each so uh pop in there if you've if you haven't read them yet uh definitely pop in there grab those <clears throat> now you, you know now's the now's your time to hop in <laughs> uh and i appreciate that um the money helps i do appreciate getting the money from sales um but what i will ask is if you'll just review those books uh will help me a great deal um that makes these promotions very much worth it so please do please hop in Check out the book. I hope you discover something you love. Uh, I am currently working on the fourth um, full-length Dan Kotler thriller, and it I'll reveal the title because I inadvertently revealed the title on the, the podcast I did with Tim Knox. <laughs> Which I, should, I hope I remember to put that in the show notes. But um, the title of the fourth book is going to be The Girl in the Mayan Tomb. I already have a cover, which I have not revealed to anyone but my street team at this point. Um very favorably, by the way. It's a good-looking cover. You're going to dig it. Um, and uh, I'm very excited about this this new book. But I'm excited about this series in general. Uh, man, I just posted a couple of articles about uh, topics such as uh, when to pivot. You know, are you selling out was the title. Um, when to pivot as an author. Uh, you can find that on the Draft a Digital blog. Uh, I've gotten such huge responses from these things. Uh, so I, I think... 
I'm hitting a nerve there. I think a lot of people are kind of thinking about their genre. Um, and as I was saying, the, the tagline from the article is choosing a genre isn't like choosing a face tattoo. <laughs> Go read it. Um, so thanks for uh, hanging around here about that. If you want to support the show, of course, you can do so. You can, uh, first of all, if you have questions for me or any of my past guests, or if you happen to know about a, a guest coming up, which I don't typically announce, uh, maybe I should, but uh, you can always call and leave me a voicemail. You can call me at 281-809-WORD. That's 281-809-9673. Uh, or you can go to wordslingerpodcast.com, and there's a little orange tab floating down the bottom right corner of the page now. It says send voicemail, so you can send me something from there. Or click on the contact button and send me an email. I'm happy to answer that. <clears throat> the news, uh, so that was part of my news, Atlantis Riddle being uh, up for promotion. And I hope you uh, pick that up and enjoy it. Uh, other news regarding Wordslinger Podcast, I'm, I'm chugging along on the website uh, sort of revamp. Not revamp, I'm building a whole new dedicated site for the for the show. Uh, really, honestly, the site itself is done uh, but I'm now it's about transferring podcast episodes <laughs> and there's some work that goes into that. Um, th- uh, for whatever reason, Squarespace does not have a way for me to export every single podcast and re import it directly to another Squarespace site. If I were going from between, uh, Squarespace and WordPress, I could do that. I could theoretically create a WordPress page, export all my episodes, export them again, uh, to import into Squarespace. You know, that's a weird workaround. But what I've decided to do is I'll just do these manually so that I can do everything right, um, give everything a personal touch. Uh, I'm redoing the uh, the uh, interview cards, the guest interview graphics that I post with each episode. So uh, it's a chance for me to, to you know basically update everything. It's been kind of interesting going through the old episodes, checking out, you know, previous wordslinger podcast episodes <laughs> some of which were uh uh rough <laughs> but not terrible i mean they were still good and I, I i i'm very proud of this show i'm very proud of what i've created here actually i'm proud of what we've created here because without you this would be me just you know talking to myself most of the time but uh it, it's been incredible to uh, go back and and sort of re-listen to a few because i've had to Early on, I didn't put a quote in my show graphic card, um, so I have to uh, listen to some of the episodes and kind of scan through them and, and see if I can find a good quote. So that's been interesting. Uh, I'm getting to hear, you know, I was not, I was, I was a little stiff when I first started. I think so. It, it's it's fun to hear the contrast between early episodes and current episodes. <laughs> The show has evolved. The sponsor segment has evolved. You know, there's a, there's been a lot. But you're going to really dig the new website and uh, what you'll be able to get out of it. Um, we're going to call this version one of it because my plan is to continuously build in things that I think are going to be helpful to you guys. Um, I'm taking a more... I am always still going to be focused on both authors and entrepreneurs, but at the, to me, the two have combined now uh, so well and integrated so well that I just assume every entrepreneur should be an author. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, building a lot of resources that are focused on the, the indie author community. Uh, you know, just keep adding stuff. Just just keep making, creating some value in the world, you know. Um Anyway, kind of like what Draft the Digital does. I mean, Draft the Digital. I'm I am so just amazingly proud to work with these guys uh, because of what they do. The uh, they released the EPUB templates this week. I don't know if you heard about this yet, but uh, new EPUB templates. We're very much. I mean, at this point, we're kind of a competitor to Vellum, frankly. I mean, not directly. I mean, that Vellum has you know a pretty robust system. It works very well. It's much more customizable than what we offer at the moment, but. You know, we've this is the second iteration of uh, improving our automated layout since uh, since I came on board because we, you know, we cre- we released our free uh, print ready PDF automated layout uh, just a couple of months ago. So there's been like seven different big announcements from Create uh, from Create Space from Draft to Digital. Sorry, guys, <laughs> from Draft for Draft to Digital as we've. Uh, bulked up our offering all of it for free all of it 
always will be free. The idea is to create resources for authors that, that help them do better in this business. And if you distribute through us, that's great. That's the only way we can make money is if you do. So I hope you do. I ask that you do. But you don't have to in order to use these free tools. So get in there. Uh, get an account going at drafttodigital.com. It will help you a lot, believe me. So do it. All right. That's going to be it. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, as always, if you want to support the show, make sure you uh, leave a review for us on iTunes especially, but anywhere you listen to the show, Stitcher, Google Play, anywhere you're, you're listening. But particularly iTunes, if you leave it on iTunes, I get a little notification. Eventually, sometimes this thing is a little slow uh, to, to tell me that someone popped in, but I'll read your review on air if you'd like. Uh, you can, uh, and please rate us, you know, four or five stars. That helps quite a bit. Tell us what you're getting out of the show. What do you like? What are you uh, digging? And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll communicate. I'll, 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 uh, if I, if you want to leave a voicemail, um, from the website, I'll play that on air. I, I do answer questions, author questions or entrepreneur questions. So feel free to ask me anything and, uh, you know, share us, get out there on social media. You can follow the show now on Twitter. Uh, we are at Wordslinger Pod. That's the show's uh, Twitter address, uh, Twitter handle. You can also follow me at Kevin Tomlinson. You can find us on uh, Facebook as well. Just type Wordslinger Podcast. That'll bring you there. And you can type my name, Kevin Tomlinson, and that'll bring you there. So and if you want to support me personally, oh, I forgot. I almost forgot. You can support the show financially through Patreon. If you go to WordslingerPodcast.com, there is a Patreon logo there. Uh, I am in, that's part of the, the revamp of, uh, the show. Uh, I've got my tiers sort of defined now. I'm going to have to start creating some assets, uh, to get that ready. Uh, lots of big things happening with the show. I mean, we're going to turn this into something that's really beneficial to you. So the more you support me, the more I can support you. So let's, let's do this together. Uh, as little as a dollar a month is very helpful. I use that money to pay for hosting. All the stuff I'm doing right now actually is being paid for with, um, money from the Patreon and other sources. So, uh, the more Patreon dollars I get, the easier this goes. So I do appreciate that. Uh, and otherwise follow, follow me, uh, share the show with everyone you love. And, um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> this is, I'm doing this a lot later in the day than I normally do. Uh, it's just been an exhausting week as you can understand. So for those of you out there who, uh, I don't really expect that if you are, uh, being caught up in the, uh, the, the tragedy of, uh, Hurricane Harvey in Houston or the surrounding area of Houston, um, I don't expect that you're spending a lot of time listening to podcasts at this point. But if you are, if you are in the, within the sound of my voice, um, I just, God bless you. And I'm praying for you. And I, if, if I can help you in any way, please ask me. I will find some way to help you. I, I, there's so many people who need help out there right now. God bless all of you. And I will see you all next time. Slinger.